Father, thanks for the privilege of being part of this congregation, a congregation you raised up many years ago to serve this community and represent you well. And I pray that we continue to do that and bring you great honor. Now we open our hearts and we say, if there's something that you need to speak into us that would be important for our lives going forward, that would enhance our relationships with one another, with you, speak. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Shame. You're probably familiar with that word, right? You've probably had an experience with shame some along, where along the way. It may have been that you were on the end of shame being shamed by an experience. Uh, sometimes that's of your own doing, and sometimes that lies at the feet of someone else. And perhaps you've had an experience, oh, I know, you've had an experience of being the shamer, not the shamey. Recently, I was speaking to a group of Windsor police officers just before they went on patrol. I had come to speak to them so that I could ask a favor of them. I'm doing a survey with them to discover a particular set of information I need for a workshop I'm doing in Wichita, Kansas in July. And so as I'm begging them to do this survey, I know they hate filling out more surveys, um, as I'm begging them to do this, I say this. I say, I know you may not receive God's favor for doing this survey, but you certainly will have mine. And without hesitation, a young guy, I'll call him Smith, he says, you don't have to worry about that. I already have God's favor. I can't pass up this moment to be at my shaming best. And I say to him, Smith, you're the only one in this room arrogant enough to assume that. Wow. That is me at my shaming best. I mean, he just, he kind of, you know, shrunk back, and I thought, I got to see him. He was out of that room so fast after it was over, and I haven't connected with him yet, so you got to pray that I'll get the opportunity to apologize for my shaming behavior. Let's just make sure we're all clear about what shame is. We'll go to the dictionary, and we'll get a definition, and the dictionary describes it this way. I'm not sure how helpful this is, but it describes it as a painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable, improper, or ridiculous. The definition I like, and I make reference to it in notes you have on the back of your bulletin, it comes from a book by a great book called the Soul of Shame by Dr. Kurt Thompson. Thompson describes shame this way. He says it's a primal, and this is a psychologist, or, well, this is a psychiatrist talking, so it's kind of convoluted, but he says it's a primal emotional pigment that colors the images of everything, our bodies, our marriages, our politics, our successes, our successes and failures, our friends and enemies. Note this especially the God of the, of the Bible, who at times may feel like both. You know what he's referring to there? When you're in the midst of an experience with shame, sometimes God seems like a friend, but sometimes in that experience he feels like an enemy. And I think that's a, a definition that works well for us. I should have put that in the bulletin so that you'd have time to think about it. But I think the preeminent question that we have before us today is how do we effectively find freedom from the, the shaming experiences all of us have been through? Let me provide you with a prime reflecting point. I want this verse to kind of reach deep within each of us. Stay focused on Jesus, who designed and perfected your faith and mine. He endured the cross and ignored the shame of that death because he focused on the joy that was set before him and now is seated beside God on the throne, a place of honor. Observations, just before we move away from that verse. There is something significant about the link that exists between shame and joy. Let me take you back to the Garden of Eden for just a moment. 
Here is Adam and Eve placed in an environment that's absolutely, incredibly beautiful, everything they could possibly, a place of great joy. And then they make a bad choice. And that bad choice is followed by a sense of fear. They hide from God. But the fear is driven by this thing called shame. And it has completely eradicated any sense of joy. <clears throat> Dr. Brene Brown, who is probably the preeminent voice and researcher of this thing called shame, Dr. Brene Brown makes this observation. When we try to numb shame in our lives, we numb joy. Did you hear that? When we try to numb shame in our lives, we numb joy. So this morning what I want to do is I want you to see the focus of the dynamic of this thing called shame through the lens of a story that John in his gospel records for us. I want you to encourage you that sometime in the next couple of days, you go to John chapter 9 and read the first 34 verses where you get the full story. But rather than kind of read that story to you this morning, I thought I might be able to cap encapsulate it. So the story that John records is the story of a young man who was born blind. And I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to be close to someone who is visually impaired. But for that person, life is always much more complex. The things that we take for granted because of our sight become much more difficult and much more awkward. And so this young man has spent his whole life dealing with the pain of being visually blind. And Jesus comes alongside of him. I want you to think not also of that young man born blind. I want you to think about his parents. Because this is a time in history when if you have a physical abnormality, if there's something wrong with you, it's generally viewed as an indicator that there's unresolved sin in your life. So this young man is not only blind, his parents are struggling with the fact that they may be responsible for his blindness, or he may even be responsible for it because of his own sin. Young man, come here. And so it is that Jesus stops for a moment, and he reaches down, and I promised Levi I wouldn't do this. He spits in the mud and spits in the dirt. He takes that new mud, he puts it over the eyes of this young blind man and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when this young man comes back, he can see everything perfectly, just like he's never had a moment of blindness in his life at all. Can you imagine what that was like for the people around him? Can you even begin to think about what it must have been like for his parents to have this incredible joy of seeing their son now completely healed. But the story didn't end there. And maybe one of the great ironies about this story is this, that the people who were most critical of what Jesus did and said were the people who were the religious leaders of the day. But not in this story. Because when you read the story, you'll discover this, that the very first question about this young man was this. It came from the lips of Jesus' own followers, his disciples, when they said, so Jesus, tell us whether this young man was born blind because of his sin or the sin of his parents. This young man has sat for years begging to make his way through life. And the disciples now want to ask a stupid question, like, whose fault? So Jesus does his little miracle. The man goes and washes, comes back. He's totally sighted now, and nobody's excited. The religious, the neighbors, first of all, the neighbors get distraught. They come and ask the question, no. Is this really the guy we thought he was? And the answer comes back, there's no denying this is the, the guy. This is the guy. But because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath, they take him to the religious leaders. 
And now the religious leaders are in hyperventilation mode. And they begin to question, so young man, who healed you? Jesus. Why is it? Maybe I'll never fully understand this, and maybe I've been responsible for too many of these things in my past. Why is it that religious leaders can't celebrate a great moment, but just end up with a bunch of questions? And the real conclusion of the story, and with that I'm going to let Levi go, the real conclusion of the story comes that the religious leaders come to the point in the whole story where they say to him, you're a sinner. And not only that, it, the story concludes with this comment. They shamed him and threw him out of the temple. Thanks, Levi. Good guy, eh? Good blind guy. It's interesting, isn't it? So let's use that story as a reflecting point and see if we can learn some things about this thing called shame and how do we find a place of freedom from shame. The words that the religious leader used on that guy when they threw him out of the temple was, you were born a total sinner. You were born a total sinner. I want to walk you through four things. And this won't solve your experience of shame, but I hope it will set you up so that you can do what Jesus did, who scorned the shame because of something that he knew was in front of him. There was a joy that he was in pursuit of. And let me tell you, you were the source of that joy. You were his joy in that moment. That's what enabled him to scorn the shame of that moment. And we'll, go, we'll do more of that on Good Friday. But here's something we need you to know. And it's certainly not the most profound statement I'll make today. In fact, you know what my little shame robot says inside of me? My little shame robot comes out in the moments when I'm preparing a message like this and it says, Chuck, you may never say anything profound. Do you understand that? Right? This is not the most profound statement I'll make. I'll acknowledge that. But this is an important statement. Everyone experiences shame. And that illustrates the fact that shame is deeply entrenched within our culture. So whether or not you know the person sitting on your left, whether or not you know the person sitting on your right, whether or not you know the person sitting in front of you, or the person sitting behind you, I can tell you something about them that you need to know. They've all experienced shame. Now, I don't want you to turn to them and say, so what was your shame experience? Or what have you, what's been your experience encounters with shame? I just want you to know that there's nobody in this building this morning, including some of the youngest among us, who hasn't experienced shame. Let me take you back to the verse that we introduced at the beginning of the message. And here's the question which comes out of that Hebrews 12, 2 verse. If Christ experienced shame, why would we think we might be exempt? Got it? So if Christ, the favored Son of God, experienced shame, why do we think we should be exempt? And while the world of psychology identifies it as probably the leading cause of emotional distress in the lives of human beings, Understanding why it matters so much to God is even more important. Shame matters to God. Shame in your life matters to God because it keeps you from the place he wants you to be. He wants you to be in a place of joy. Let me go back to Kurt Thompson for just once more. From the beginning, this has been God's purpose for this world to be one of emerging goodness, beauty, and joy. Evil has wielded shame as a primary weapon to see that that world never happens. From the beginning, this has been God's purpose for the world, to be one of emerging goodness, beauty, and joy. Evil has wielded shame as a primary weapon to see 
that that world never happens. And while it may not be profound, I truly believe there's no other starting point for us to find freedom from shame than simply understanding I'm not alone in this battle. And every time I encounter a shaming experience, I need to know that there's nobody else that I'll ever meet on this day who hasn't had their own set of shaming experiences. Or, and in my case, become a very good shamer. Second observation. Shame isolates. Shame isolates. Recently I had a conversation with a young woman who had extricated herself from a very abusive marriage. She spoke of the, how in her family of origin there was great chaos. And so she fled from her family of origin at a very young age because of the uncertainty of life. However, the loneliness she experienced in her time away from anybody close to her drove her into a relationship that was not healthy or esteeming. And she declared, the reason I stayed in that marriage was simply this. These are her words. I felt I had to tough it out. I felt I had to tough it out. And when she finished describing the shame that she lived with during those years, I asked her this simple question. What do you think it's cost you to live with that kind of shame, to live in that silence? I could never be fully comprehensive of all she told me, but she told me this. There was a growing hatred for the man to whom I'd been married. There was an inability to consider myself worthy of love. There was a growing resentment toward my parents for the chaos with which I grew up. There was a distrust of the men with whom I worked. There was an emotional distance from my kids when they needed me most. And then finally through her tears she said this. There was a loss of relationship. <laughs> there was a loss of my relationship with God. Because why would he ever want any, anything to do with a loser like me? Every one of us experiences shame. And the painful part of shame in our lives is that it isolates us. But there's a third thing that I think we can make by way of observation, and it's this. Knowing the facts won't set you free from shame. You can watch YouTube, Brene Brown, probably number one in terms of this subject. But here's a statement I want you to take note of. Because shame is episodic in, in its nature, no amount of talk or knowledge will set you free from shame. Let's make sure you understand when I use the word episodic. What I mean by that word is it's something birthed in a profoundly impacting emotional experience. Something birthed in a profoundly impacting emotional experience. And because it's episodic in nature, shame, there's only one thing that sets you free. It's an equally or greater profound impacting emotional experience. And I'm going to suggest to many of you that the reason we know a measure of freedom from the shame we've had in the past is because we've had a profoundly impacting emotional connection to Jesus Christ. Because he's the one who was able to scorn the shame in order to get to the place of joy. I have a friend in ministry who spent a fair bit of time as a result of emotional breakdown he had in his life. He spent a fair bit of time at a, in a psych ward at a hospital. And during one of the group meetings that they had at the hospital, they were each telling their story, and it came to a young woman, and she told the experience of how, as a child in elementary school, she went out to recess, and when she came back from recess, the teacher had carefully taken all the valentines the kids had, had brought to school, and they, she'd placed them on each student's desk. But when she got to her desk, there was no valentine. Not a one. 
As she was reflecting back in her adult years to that moment, and the sense that she felt, nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. And it was a shaming experience in her life. So my friend got a couple of his buddies, and like this is October or something, maybe even September, and they call up a party store. And they ask the clerk in the party store, do you have any Valentines? And she says, I think somewhere, they're probably back in storage. Well, we would like to order X number of Valentines and have them delivered to the psychiatric hospital. Yeah, <laughs> you're beginning to get what it feels like on the other end of the line, right? I've just been asked in September to deliver Valentine's to a psychiatric hospital. Well, that makes total sense. But the amazing thing is that they got their Valentine's delivered. And the next day the group met in therapy session. When the young woman came to take her place, guess what was on her seat? A whole bunch of Valentine's. Is that an episodic experience for her? Is that profoundly impacting from emotional state, uh, from an emotional place? You want to believe it is. She was inundated with Valentine's. This is a fact. Knowing more, or even talking through more, doesn't effectively free us from shame. But it is in the context of a meaningful encounter with God's love and the embrace of others, the freedom from shame came, comes. So let me make my fourth observation, and with that we'll wrap it up. My fourth observation would be, well, let me just before I do that, give you one more thought from Kurt Thompson. I think this is important. Shame, isn't, shame is not something we fix in the privacy of our mental processes. Evil would love for us to believe that is so. We combat it within the context of conversation, prayer, and other communal embodied actions. That's great. That's where huge shame gets healed. In the context of prayer, conversation, and other embodied communal activities. My final point is this. You find yourself freed from shame? You find yourself healed from your blindness? Don't you think everybody's going to celebrate? And this is one of the great ironies. If you find yourself in the position of being freed from your shame, not everybody's going to celebrate with you. It's just a fact. You need to know that in advance. Because let's go back to the story of the young man born blind for a moment. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for his parents not to be able to celebrate the fact that their son now sees. I, I can't begin to fathom why religious leaders who, instead of throwing a party to celebrate this man's recovered sight, simply shame and throw him out of the synagogue. Two op observations that will allow me to wrap this up. Observation number one. When a person is healed, it always serves as a reminder to others that there was something wrong. Does that make any sense? Healing always serves as a reminder. Healing, whether it's emotional, spiritual, physical, always serves as a reminder that there was something wrong, and people don't like to acknowledge there's something wrong. And the second observation would be this. My freedom from shame will only remind others of their unresolved shame. If I find myself in a position of freedom from shame, it'll only serve to remind others that maybe they haven't yet discovered freedom from shame. I don't know how else to explain the reaction of the religious leaders of that day. So simply put, let me close with this thought. We have a great opportunity this morning to celebrate the fact that there is one thing that God would love to free us from. Oh, there's many things. 
But this one thing is the focus of this morning. God would love to free us from our circumstances where we've been the shamer, shamer or the shamey. Why? Because he longs for us to live in joy. It's really that simple. We're going to invite you in a moment to take communion with us. And in taking communion, it's going to be a reminder that Jesus died a horrible, awful, shameful death. But he was able to scorn that shame because of the joy that lay ahead. And if you take the opportunity to come and receive these gifts of his this morning, he's going to be filled with joy because that's what he was waiting for. He was the one who scorned the shame. He is the one who set the example for us. Let me take a moment to pray, and then I want you to listen very carefully because I've, we've asked Karen to sing a song over you. You may be familiar with the song, you may not, but please allow God to speak that song deep into your soul. Father, you came this morning. You promised you should show it up. You say when two or three gather in your name, as we did right off the top, you promised to be there. And you're here for a purpose. You long for us to have the great freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from shame. So if there's someone that needs a healing touch, may you offer it freely. And may they find in it great joy. For Christ's sake. Amen.